Well, good morning to you, and sincerely, I really, really wish that you were here, wish that we were still able to meet together, and if you're a guest that is just joining us online today, let me just tell you what's going on. That is that we've had a number within our church family that have uh, caught the coronavirus, some uh, very serious cases, and because of the number of exposures that we've had within the church family, the decision was made that we're going to go online for, for two Sundays, so this Sunday and the next, that's the 29th of August as well. Uh, unfortunately, this is how we're going to have to meet, but thankfully we can still meet this way. And so sincerely, I am grateful uh, that you're spending part of your day, even though remotely, that we are able to worship together. Sincerely, I'm glad that you're here. And uh, if you'd like some more information about Gate City Baptist Church, uh, if you're not connected with us, we'd love for you to reach out to us so that we can share with you part of what it is that God is doing here and about the story of what uh, God is accomplishing in the lives of people here. We'd love to share that story. So please reach out to us. We'd love to help you. Even though you may be at home or you are sitting behind a desk somewhere and it doesn't maybe look like a sanctuary or feel like a church, the reality is, thankfully, we worship a God that is everywhere. And you can call on Him, and you can worship Him right where you are. And that's going to be our goal today. And so join me as we commit our time together in prayer and ask God to even speak to us in ways that are far different than maybe what we're accustomed to. So pray with me. Father, we just want to come to you and say, first of all, thank you that you have made it possible that even in the throes of a pandemic and a number of cases within our church where uh, this horrible virus has been and is spreading. Uh, we're grateful that technology exists so that we can still even uh, remotely worship you together. I pray, God, that you might help us in our homes or wherever it is that we're watching this, that you might remove distractions, that doorbells won't ring, that phones won't ring, that maybe kids won't be crying, that these types of things that may keep us from focusing on you, God, that you might uh, help us to not be distracted by those, to direct our attention to you and experience you right where we are. So, Lord, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? above all things, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all things, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love that 
You know, there are some words that when we hear, there is, uh, there's a thought that comes to our mind, positive or negative. And l let me just give you one of those words, timeshare. Now, some of you hearing that, your eyes might have just rolled back in your head and you're thinking, oh my goodness, timeshare, because for so many, uh, that bears such negative connotation. Now, I'm not suggesting that they are always bad and that they never make sense under any circumstances, but I am saying that there have been an awful lot of people, and maybe you're one of them who would say, I've had a bad experience with a timeshare. Now, until a few years ago, I had had really no experience to speak of with a timeshare or getting one or even enduring a presentation. But a few years ago, we had taken the kids to Williamsburg, Virginia. And while there, we uh, were aware that there's a Bush Gardens theme park in, uh, in Williamsburg. We'd, we'd like to have taken the kids there, but I mean, the tickets were really expensive. We heard about this timeshare presentation, and long story short, they would pay us for listening for 90 minutes to... Uh, to, after enduring that, they'd pay us enough that would effectively buy our tickets. So we thought, you know, that's 90 minutes. We can endure that, and there's not a chance in the world we're going to say yes unless they are literally saying, here it is, it's free. We've got, at that point, we had five kids. There's no, we can't afford this. We're just going to go get our free tickets to, to Bush Gardens. And so on that particular morning, we arrived at the location, and you go in this building, and it's kind of like a doctor's office in the sense that there's a receptionist and there's this waiting area. You sign in, they called uh, my name, and I uh, went up there, and they gave me some paperwork to fill out. But instead of like HIPAA forms at the doctor's office, these were asking some different questions, and I don't remember any of the questions except for one. It asked this very specifically, have you had or consumed any alcohol or been inebriated in the past 24 hours? I thought, you know, that's an interesting question to be asked before I go into a timeshare presentation. 
And it's pretty clear why they were asking that. Because they don't want you in the future to say, you know what, I was just too drunk. I had no idea what I was doing. I partied too much the night before. And so that's why I signed up for this timeshare presentation. And anyway, as, as I'm sitting there and I'm filling out the answer to that question, which thankfully I was able to say no to, uh, as, as I was able to do that, I was thinking to myself, you know, um, that's a pretty strong indicator that this is likely a bad idea. That signing up for a timeshare is a bad idea because if I have to say, no, I'm not drunk, well, that, that's a pretty strong red flag. This might not be something that is good for me. You know, there's a lot of times in life where we are on the cusp of making a bad decision or choice or we are exposed to something that could be to our detriment and there are red flags. And many times they're very clear, and we can and we should pay attention to them. But sometimes the red flags are a little more subtle. Now, that being said, let me say this. Hopefully, uh, you're someone who has a personal relationship with the Lord. And as that's the case, hopefully you would say, I don't want to be led astray. I would hate to be deceived. I would hate to think something about God, about the Bible, that is not true. I don't want to be deceived. Now, that being said, there are people in your life Maybe you'll be going to school with them starting this coming week. Maybe it is that you work with them. Maybe there is possibly that they're in a Sunday school class with you or you used to go to church with them. Maybe it's some preacher even that you could watch on TV. Hopefully not this one, but it's possible you're exposed to some people that are saying some things to you about God, about the Bible that are not true. And they're going to try to deceive you with that. Hopefully you don't want that. Now the challenge is people who are deceivers aren't wearing a name tag that says liar, liar, and their pants aren't always on fire. And so it's, it's not easy to detect them. So here's the question I want you to think about with me today. How is it that I can identify false teachers in my life that I need to avoid? Now we're thinking about this through the lens of a continuing series that I'm calling Bad Religion, When Good Christianity Goes Bad. And unfortunately there are people as it was in the days of the, when the Bible was written all the way through today, that are, are making statements about God, about the Bible, about a worldview that are not correct, that are wrong. And are, it may even sound religious, but it's really bad. It's really dangerous. And you want to be able to identify that. So how can you do so? Look with me today in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23. And we're going to start with verse 9. I hope you'll find your Bible, leave it open, follow along with me, because we're going to drop in at a few places. Starting in verse 9, we're told concerning the prophets, and Jeremiah is talking here, My heart is broken within me, and all my bones tremble. I have become like a drunkard, like a man overcome by wine, because of the Lord, because of His holy words. The land is full of adulterers. The land mourns because of the curse, and the grazing lands in the wilderness have dried up. Their way of life has become evil, and their power is not rightly used, because both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil. This is the Lord's declaration. All right, so starting in what we see here, I believe God shares through Jeremiah the answer to how it is, not only in Jeremiah's day, but even today, that I can identify false teachers that I need to ignore. And the first thing that I need to do is this. I need to pay attention to the target. Pay attention to the target. Now, I, I don't want to bore you with a whole lot of history and a ton of background detail, except to say this. Jeremiah, in terms of job, in terms of task and function, he's a prophet. And he has been called by God. God has put a call in his life to be a, a mouthpiece, a messenger to the people of God. And these are specifically those that are in the southern kingdom of Judah. And so God uh, has a message that he wants to communicate to the people of Judah. And it's very simple. Things are really bad. You are the people of God, but you don't act like it. You don't look like it at all. You and your hearts, your lives, your behavior, your choices, all of those things are so ridiculously far from me. And if you do not return back to me, if you don't get things back together, if you don't turn from this and come back and heed my pleas, my invitations to come back, then I'm going to bring some judgment on you. Not to make you squirm like a worm, but to cause you to come back to me, to prompt your attention to be regained by me. And so he's speaking through people like Jeremiah. Unfortunately, while Jeremiah is a prophet, there are others who are saying, well, I, I'm a prophet too. And effectively having the name tag on said, I, I, I'm a prophet as well. You need to pay attention to what I'm saying. The problem is they were not actually speaking the truth. And starting in verse 9, 
Jeremiah begins to, to describe as God is speaking through him the difficulty of what's going on. And he says con concerning these prophets, Jeremiah says, uh, my heart and even the heart of God is broken based on what is seen. And because what, what is going on in verse 10, he says, the land is full of adulterers. Now, that could reference those that are actively engaged in violating their marital vows, but it seems that this is probably describing spiritual infidelity, where you've got people who are supposed to be in relationship with God, and they're violating that relationship. They are effectively cheating on God. And Jeremiah sees this, God sees this, and their hearts are broken by it. Unfortunately, this is something that is affecting the people of Judah from tip to tail. You see in verse 11 it says, Both prophet and priest are ungodly. And he says, Even in my house I have found their evil. So, so Jeremiah is saying, God is saying, Listen, even the people that are vocational ministers, those that are involved supposedly in the ministry, those that are priests and are supposed to be the ones pointing you to God, even in my house, in the temple... I can see, and there are tangible demonstrations of their wickedness. That's how bad things are. And God is speaking through Jeremiah, but you have these individuals that are living in open rebellion against God that are effectively saying to the people what? Pay attention to verse 14. He says, Among the prophets of Jerusalem also I saw a horrible thing. They commit adultery, they walk in lies, and they strengthen the hands of evildoers. And none turns his back on evil. So what he's saying is that you have these individuals that are saying, hey, I've got a message, a word from God, but what they actually say, as people pay attention to it, what does it accomplish? It causes them to get further out of bounds. Verse 12 again says that they strengthen the hands of evildoers. In fact, back in verse 11, he's saying that there, there are individuals that say, oh, I've got a message from God, but the God that they're talking about is Baal, a, a false god, an idol, a Canaanite god. He's not even real. And so you have these individuals that are false prophets, and God is using Jeremiah to say to his people, hey, here's how you can identify them, but how you do so is to pay attention to the target. What does that mean? But before going there, let me say this. It is possible that your eyes could be gla glazing over at this point. You say, this has nothing to do with me. Uh, this southern kingdom, northern kingdom, Judah, all this false prophet stuff. I, I don't have false prophets in my life. Hear me in this. There are people in your life. There are. Maybe they're peers at work, at school, in the neighborhood. Maybe it's in entertainment, maybe it's in media, whatever. But there are individuals that are speaking into your heart, into your life, and they are affecting, having an impact on what you believe and understand to be true. True about the Bible, it's true about God. And what they are saying, just because it sounds religious or sounds spiritual or may even sound pleasant, does not mean that it's actually the truth. So how can you identify that? They're not wearing a name tag that says liar. How can you identify them? Again, I would say to you, you need to pay attention to the target. See where the bullet lands. Well, what does that mean? Well, a few years ago, uh, for his birthday, Andrew had gotten some money. <clears throat> and he decided what he wanted was a pellet gun. We had done some research and found that the one that he wanted was over at Academy Sports, just uh, around the corner. And I had taken him over there. Uh, we, we bought this uh, pellet gun. We come home. And one of the neat things about this one is that this pellet gun came with a scope. Now, maybe you've never fired a gun, pellet gun, or real gun, or what, whatever uh, before, but how a scope, hopefully you're aware of this, how it works, it sits on top of the gun, and it magnifies the target off in the distance. And there are crosshairs, and so you line the crosshairs up against the target towards the bullseye, and then you squeeze the trigger. And what it should do is help you actually hit the target. All right, so the problem is this. Just putting a scope on a weapon, just putting a scope on Andrew's gun did not cause it to shoot straight. You could aim at the target and still not hit it. So what you had to do is sight it in. And how that works is that you put the scope on the, the gun, you, you get it held still, and then you squeeze the trigger and fire around. You aim at the target and then fire around. Well, if you fire a couple of them and every time it's going low and to the right, you know I need to adjust the scope to cause it 
to, to go higher so that when I'm aiming, I, I, I can raise, I, I'm raising the end of the gun up so that when I'm looking through the scope, when I'm looking through those crosshairs, what the crosshairs are lining up against is what I'm actually going to hit. Now, that's what I'm saying that you and I need to do as followers of Jesus so that we don't get led astray by people that are effectively wolves in sheep's clothing. We need to pay attention to the target and where the bullets of what they are saying actually are landing. Now they may be saying, hey, I'm, what I'm saying, this is, this, is, this is from the Bible, this is about Jesus, this sounds very spiritual, uh, this sounds very nice and noble, but pay attention to the target. What they say, when those words land, are they at odds with what God has said? Are, are, are they saying something that is literally opposed to what the, the Bible itself teaches? Is what they are saying about God and the, the picture that they're painting about God, does, does that God even exist? You know, honestly, we see that many times today where people love the thought of Jesus and they like to talk about Jesus. We live in a world that loves Jesus, just not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus that is loved by our country at large is one that is effectively a, a big teddy bear that just, just wants to hug us and affirm us in everything that we do. But the Jesus of the Bible loves us enough to say, listen, that is wrong, that is not good for you, that separates you from God. The Jesus of the Bible says, I have come to solve a problem that you have. You are not okay. Things are really wrong. Things are really bad. That's the Jesus of the Bible, but unfortunately we are around people that are communicating a God that doesn't exist and calling things truth that are actually not. Again, they're not always easy to see. They're not always easy to spot. So pay attention to the target. What they are saying, measure it against what God has already said. Measure it against what God has already revealed about himself, about what is true, about what is right, and what is wrong. The second thing you need to do is this. See what God is doing in people. See what God is doing in people. Starting in, in verse 15, he says, this is what the Lord of armies says concerning the prophets. He says, I'm, I'm about to feed them to wormwood, to give them poison water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. So he's saying, God is saying, speaking through Jeremiah, listen, things are getting bad, and there are people that are effectively signing my name to statements that I didn't make. There are people that are saying, God said this, and God didn't say it. They are affirming things that God has said are wrong. They are saying things that are wrong that God has said are right, and it's, it's, it's just terrible. And so this continues in verse 16. It says, this is what the Lord of armies says, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They are deluding you. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the Lord's mouth. They keep on saying to those who despise me, the Lord has spoken, you will have peace. So I mean, listen, they, they are saying to people that hate God, that are living in open rebellion against God, hey, everything's fine. It's all good. Everything, there, there's not a problem. Keep doing what you're doing. Bravo. You're doing just great. But God didn't say that. They're saying you have peace when the problem is that there's not actually peace. Peace. Verse 18, he says, Who has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and hear his word? These people haven't. They're saying they've got a message from God, but they don't. They haven't paid attention to his word and obeyed. And so, skip down to verse 21 and pay attention to this. It says, and God is speaking here. He says, I did not send out these prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. If they had really stood in my counsel, they would have enabled my people to hear my words and would have turned them from their evil ways and their evil deeds. There are people that are deceiving the people of God. They're encouraging them and affirming them and continuing to go down the wrong path. That happened in Jeremiah's day. That type of thing happens, unfortunately, even our day. And it can, unfortunately, happen to you. But this is one of the things that you've got to keep in mind. As God works through people, to impact others, as God works through you to impact others. Every time he does this, it has a specific aim and goal, and that is to draw others unto himself. When God works in my life, in your life, or God works in your life, in the life of someone else, the aim is to draw someone closer to God, not further away. And as they come to him, he begins to do a work in their life 
He begins to transform them because He's told us in His Word that He not only predestined us to adoption as sons, but He predetermined, He decided beforehand that we would be conformed to the image of His Son. So, in short, as God works in and through the lives of people, it is to draw people to Himself so that He can work in their lives to make them more like Jesus, for Him to transform their lives. But pay attention to what's going on in Jeremiah's day. There are people who are saying, Oh, no, I've got a word from God. I've got a message. You ought to pay attention to this. But what, what has happened? He says, If they actually had a word from God, they would have enabled my people to hear from me. And if that would have happened, and they would have re realized God is speaking, what would have happened? They would have turned from their evil ways and their evil deeds. As, as a person, if I am doing what God wants me to and sharing His truth, His message with others, if people actually pay attention to that and respond positively to that, the result is that it's going to lead them closer to God. It is going to enable the Lord to work in their lives because that's what He does. He draws people to Himself and then He works in their lives. That's a pretty clear way that God is speaking through that person. And God through Jeremiah says, hey, listen, that's not going on in this case. Jeremiah is describing individuals who are wearing a name tag on that says, hey, I'm with God and I've got the uniform, I'm a prophet, and people are paying attention to what they're saying, but as they're paying attention, they're becoming less and less obedient to God. They're getting further and further and further away from God. And what happens? They're continuing in their evil ways and their evil deeds. In fact, it's almost as if they've gotten a pat on the back and encouragement to keep going down the wrong road. What I'm saying is that if you want to make sure that you're not deceived by a false teacher, look at what God is doing in the lives of those that are listening to what a person is saying. So let me step back to say this. There are people in your life that are trying to affect you. They're saying things about the Bible, saying things about God, saying things that affect worldview and perspective. They're not only doing this in your life, they're doing this in the lives of others. As people pay attention to that, what's the fruit? As people do what they say, what's the result? Are people becoming more like Jesus and getting closer to God? Or are they getting further away from Him and less like Jesus? What I'm saying is, pay attention to what God is doing in the lives of people. A few months ago, Nathan, our oldest, got his learner's permit, and thankfully, and I'm so grateful I can say this, that things have gotten better. Those first few weeks especially, first couple of months, I didn't know if I was going to make it. I really thought a heart attack was in my future. Um, but one of the things early on I had to get him to get straight in his mind was this, that when I am riding with him, if I tell him to do something, he has to do it, and he has to do it then. And so, for example, like if we're, if we're to leave the, the church parking lot and turn left uh, onto Hilltop Road, uh, that's going onto a, a five-lane road, and so you've got uh, two potential, well, you've got traffic going in, in different directions, and so it's really important to pay attention to where the cars are, and sometimes you've got a very small window to move. And so I, I have said to him before, Nathan, I need you to go now, now. And then, like, he would dawdle. And finally, I would say to him things like this, Nathan, is your favorite steak a T-bone? Because that's what's getting ready to happen to us. We're going to get T-boned because you're not doing what I say. So here's what I need you to do. When I say something, I need you to do it. And if you do it, that's going to keep us out of an accident. If you don't do what I say, and then we get in an accident, we're going to have a real problem. So what, what was I encouraging him to do? To pay attention to the fruit of what I was saying. That if he does what I say, that we stay out of wrecks. Listen, there are people in your life this past week, this coming week, especially with school starting to students and to teenagers, we are children. There are people that are going to be trying to influence you, trying to make a difference in what it is that you believe to be true, what it is that you believe to be right, what is acceptable, what, what God has done or isn't done, hasn't done, whether He's real or not. They're trying to make all of these statements, and many of them are not true. They're not accurate. So you need to do this. Look at the lives of those that are paying attention to what they have said. Is it a wreck 
Or is it the life of somebody that is walking with God and He is working in their life, making them increasing like Jesus? I want you to understand that unfortunately as a follower of Jesus, you do have an enemy and Satan wants to deceive you. He wants to get you off track. He wants to lead you off course further, from further, and, further and further from God and he will use deceivers, deceivers that are not always easy to identify. And so that doesn't happen to you, so that doesn't happen to me. We need to pray and say, God, give us discernment so that we can identify the red flags as you raise them. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we have read and we have heard what you've said, I really do pray simply that we have not and will not be merely hearers of the word, but doers also. Because we do have a target on our back as followers of you. And there are people around us, and they may not have official title and capacity uh, or official position, but they are speaking into our lives, into our hearts. They're teaching us things about you, about your word, but it may be that they're teaching us wrongly. They're deceiving us. They're leading us off the path. And so, Lord, I pray that we might pay attention to the red flags, to, to give heed to, to what they are saying. How is that manifesting itself in the lives of other people? Because when you are at work and when you have a word, it draws me closer to you. It makes me more like Jesus. And when, I, when someone has a word from you, it lines up with what you have already said. So, Lord, help us to be those that are not deceived and that as we follow you, we stay on track. Lord, for those that may be hearing this and do not yet have a relationship with you, I pray, God, that they realize, not because it's Michael or because I've been to school or because I've done anything, but ultimately that they can realize that you are speaking through this feeble vessel this morning, helping them to hear and to know that you love them, that they are separated from you, but in Christ you've made it possible to have a real relationship. And Lord, if that's the case, I ask that you would give them the courage to lead them, to respond to us, to reach out to us so that we can help them know and experience you in a way that will change their life and it will change their eternity. And so we say thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, thank you again for spending part of your day worshiping with us. Let me again just remind you, we will not be meeting in person again next Sunday. So the August the 29th, we will not be meeting this coming Wednesday. There are no in-person activities as well. In fact, our Wednesday activities are not going to begin until September the 8th. And so for those within our church family that have been affected, keep them in your prayers uh, as school starts. Pray that God keeps you and your family and teachers and kids all around us uh, well as this virus is going crazy. But listen, thanks again for worshiping with us today. If we can help you in any way, please reach out to us. If you want to know about what's going on more here at Gate City, we'd love to share the story of what God has been and is doing. You have a great day and God bless you.